After that, maybe everyone will feel ready to for this talk um, called Yanhui Has No Fixed Address, uh, because maybe we all feel we have no fixed address now. <laughs> uh, but first, I'd like to introduce our honored speaker, uh, Professor Mark Csikszentmihalyi, a professor and Eliezer Chair of International Studies at University of Ber UC Berkeley. Uh, he received his bachelor's in East Asian languages and civilization at Harvard and a PhD in Asian languages from Stanford. He uses both excavated and transmitted texts to reconstruct the religions, philosophies, and cultures of early China. Uh, his books include Material Virtue, Ethics, and the Body in Early China, and Readings in Han Chinese Thought. He's currently translating a set of Song Dynasty essays on the Zhuangzi, and he is editor of the Journal of Chinese Religions. But beyond all that, he's also a friend of our community. Um, he is, has been a classmate of Shari. Uh, Sarah and I have both had the privilege of taking some of his classes, and also he's a good friend of Marty, and I'm sure there are other connections as well. And um, it's um, we're glad to finally welcome you here from uh, as close as Berkeley. You should have come much earlier. We should have invited you much earlier. And I'd also just like to say that as um, his student in a class on Confucius and later a class, a seminar on Zhuangzi, um, I don't necessarily remember the specific content after so many years, but I do remember the presence and the the embodiment of some of what we were studying, but also the ability to inspire curiosity and inspire students to let go of pre preconceived notions about Confucius and Zhuangzi and these texts. So today, everyone hope you will be ready for something like that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. It means a lot to um, whoa. Um, to uh, be able to 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 visit uh, former students and um, uh, friends. And um, uh, I'm sorry, Shari is not here. I, I, I just uh, she's online. Hi, Shari. Um, uh, so, so, and I'd like to thank the musicians too. Uh, the two performances were lovely, and uh, just thanks for hosting me. It's it is it is long. Um, I'm going to move this a little further because it's getting a lot of feedback of some kind. Um, is that no? It's off. That's strange. Okay. Um, so uh, let's see. And. Okay, and the other thing is, um, how do I? The projector was on, but oh, it's on. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah. Give it up one second. All right, that's great. Okay, so th th thank you for having me, and and it's really a pleasure to be here and to spend uh, twenty four hours on this campus, um, and. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, Marty said, you know, do you think you could give a talk on the Zhuangzi? And I am currently teaching a seminar, um, my seminar on Zhuangzi reception. And I was trying to think of kind of a, a topic. And I, lately I've been working on kind of um, Yanhui stories in early China. And I thought reading kind of Yanhui is a particularly interesting kind of um, exercise for an audience like this. Because Yan Hui, although he's usually thought of as a Confucian disciple, um, in the Song and Ming, he takes on a special kind of, uh, of valence. Um, he's associated uh, in some ways with Taoist traditions. And indeed, if you go back to um, uh, uh, the early texts, you see that he's talking about a certain type of inward turn that then in the Song and Ming is, is kind of, uh, uh, kind of re rediscovered in a way. And he becomes, of, of, all the, of all the characters in the Zhuangzi, 
um, he becomes one of the, the ones that is, is most often um, identified with uh, or it, it, you know, what he says and what he talks about is identified as uh, bridges to uh, uh, Confucian texts and Buddhist texts during that time. So um, the, the way I'm gonna talk about this is to talk about Yen Hui through, through commentary. And, and really the subtext of this is the two reading rooms I saw downstairs. So, so there, there, there's a room that is like for course reserves. And then there's a room for kind of Chinese texts and a room for Buddhist texts. And really this is a story about those two rooms uh, and their relationship with one another. And I'm not advocating breaking down the walls between those rooms. Really what I'm doing is I'm kind of looking historically at the way those two rooms interact, why people during certain times spent their time in one room, um, and exclusively and other times moved rather freely between those rooms. And I think that the best place to see this isn't to look at the classics because the classics are really embedded in traditions, right? But to look at commentarial practice because it's in the commentaries that people begin to read traditions against each other to bring in texts like the Yijing or the Shijing or, or during the Ming, actually the Chutsu, you know, the, the songs of the South into their readings of uh, 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 these texts. And at other times decide not to, we're going to, you know, and I'll, I'll give you an example of during, during the Han when Yen Hui was reimagined as almost exclusively a, a kind of a Confucian figure and why that happened, okay? so. So, so it's about Yen Hui, but it's also about commentary and the different types of reading practices you get at different times um, and that affect how one does commentary. So there are kind of four parts to this talk. I'm gonna spend a lot of time at the beginning just to give you examples of, of the different aspects of Yen Hui in the early tradition. And by the early tradition here, I'm talking about kind of before 100 BCE. So around that time, you begin to get a, a separation of things. There's an initial taxonomy in the Shuji around that time that divides up ways of governing and you get, begin to get the category of Ru and Dao being applied to books. And that's really kind of becomes more, uh, uh, more fixed uh, in a, 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 a a couple centuries later, as you begin to, to apply those terms to bibliographical categories. And then of course, that's also the period during which uh, uh, you, you, you get Buddhist texts coming in and you begin to get the San Jiao being kind of defined in a certain way. So I'm, when I say early, I'm really talking about up through kind of the Western Han period. Um, and then in the first century, we're gonna look at the way that these different themes, which I'll show you really stretch across a wide variety of texts. Yin Hui isn't just a kind of Confucian figure. Why, when his biography was written in the first century BC, he became a kind of Analects figure. He was a, a figure associated with Confucius. And really that continues until we get, I mean, with some exceptions, until we get to the Song and Ming. And I wanna talk about how changes in reading practices in that time began to recover this more robust Yen Hui, that's who's not just a kind of disciple, generic disciple of Confucius. And then in the last part, I just wanna reflect on kind of some of the things about how the genre of commentary creates and eliminates boundaries across traditions. And how, well, you know, um, sometimes people think of commentary as just a, a way of glossing and helping you read the classics or the sutras. Um, I'm gonna argue that actually there is a really interesting kind of uh, 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 something going on in reading practices that commentaries shed light on in a way that other types of texts can't. They might not be kind of, philosophical or religious works in and of themselves because they're kind of you know, attached to other texts. 
But in the way that they read those texts, there's actually quite a bit going on. Um, so the first part of this is to talk about portrayals of Yen Hui. So Yen Hui, um, uh, who you know as Yen, Yen Yuan or Yen Hui, uh, appears quite often in both the Analects and in, 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 in the Zhuangzi, for example, and across kind of the early literature. Now I'm gonna group kind of two different stories. One are kind of generic appearances of Yen Hui. That is, he's, he's kind of a generic disciple um, who is basically kind of um, uh, pitching softballs to Kongzi for Kongzi to um, a, a, a kind of answer. And, and, and it, that's the kind of true of many of the key disciples of, of Kongzi, of Confucius. Um, but there are three themes that I want to illustrate, or I want to focus on, that are fairly unique to Yen Hui. Um, and, and so let, let's start out with the kind of generic disciple passages. So the first, first aspect is just when he's kind of lobbing those softballs to Yen Hui, feeding questions to, uh, to, to Kongzi. Um, so, for example, in a kind of warring states te uh, text um, that, that was bought by the Shanghai Museum, uh, called Yen Hui Ask Questions of Kongzi. There are questions like, dare I ask if there is a way um, uh, for the uh, gentleman to enter service? Um, actually, this character is nay. So some people read this as kind of, you know, things, things at home in some way. But I think, I think now people are reading it more as Rusher. Uh, kind of to, to, to enter service. And, and so it's just an occasion for um, uh, uh, different, um, uh, for Kongzi to, 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 to kind of uh, uh, start discoursing on certain things. Um, uh, a, famous, a famous question is in, in the Analects, Yen Yuan once asked about benevolence. Um, so this is, this is kind of an interesting one because there are three questions in a row by different disciples. And the first one is by Yen Hui. And, um, and uh, the, he answers each disciple differently. And there are two ways of looking at that. One is that the classical story of how the Analects came together was that there were different notes taken by dis different disciples. And so somehow at, at some point, the disciples kind of put together this, this compilation. And so that's why you have three different disciples asking uh, uh, the same question and getting three different answers. By the Song, when Zhu Xi is, is talking about this, his commentary says, this is basically an upaya. You know, what, what, what the reason for these different answers is that each of these disciples has different kind of needs. And so they're different answers. So they're, they're, they're kind of different versions of this. In, in the, you know, the, in the original one, then it's just Yen Hui's, Yen Yuan's notes uh, that, that, you know, that, 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 that are the reason he's the interlocutor. Um, in Zhu Xi's reading, it's, he, he plays almost a much more important role because it's his particular needs that are dictating the, the answer. Um, then in, 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 in the Zhuangzi, um, he, uh, several times in the Zhuangzi, he says, you know, I heard someone say this, uh, can you explain this to me? So it'll often have quotes. It says, uh, Yen Yuan asked Zhong Ni, uh, second born Ni is, is, is another name for Confucius. I heard you say, never send anything away, never welcome anything, can I ask the reason for this? And so these are all kind of examples, but, but it's, an, it's not that all of the disciples are interchangeable in this way. It's simply that uh, there's not much uh, besides kind of, you know, going, you know, listening to, to what the master says and then going away and, you know, spending three days thinking about it and then, you know, saying, you know, this is, this is amazing. I've, you've changed my life kind of thing. Um, so another aspect that I would say is kind of a generic disciple uh, thing that Yen Hui uh, talks about, um, or, or, or that Yen Hui appears, uh, especially in the Analects, and I'm, I'll, I'll give you why I think this is a, the case really in the Analects um, I'll, I'll, uh, in a little bit, is 
as comparing disciples. So either, either evaluating, you know, saying Yen Hui is particularly good at this or is, you know, this, this, this word describes him, that word doesn't describe him, is comparing disciples. So the master said to Zugong, who is better, you or Yen Hui? Zugong says, how dare I compare myself with Hui? Um, I hear one point, um, uh, excuse me, Hui hears one point and, and he knows all about a subject. Um, uh, I hear one point and, and just know a second one. So um, I guess that means Yen Hui is five times better. Um, so, um, and the master says, you are not equal to him. I grant you, you are not equal to him. It's D.C. Lau's translation, but, but really kind of D.C. Lau is skirting the fact that it kind of looks like it could be read, you know, I'm also not um, as good as him too. That's another way to read that passage. Um, or here we got the master says, Hui is perhaps difficult to improve on. He allows himself to constantly be in dire poverty. Si, and that's, that's going back here, um, uh, Zugong uh, refuses to accept his lot and indulges in money-making, but is frequently right in his trend. Uh, conjectures. So this is, and and so these kind of comparisons, the Lunyu is full of it. In fact, Yen Hui, um, about half the appearances of Yen Hui are, are somehow these kind of evaluation or comparison passages in the Analects. Not in, not in the Zhuangs at all though. So, so those are, I think, fairly generic in some sense. But there are a couple of or three themes that I want to isolate. I think, you know, arguably there are more, but three themes I want to isolate in the early text that I really want to point out make Yen Hui a little bit different and might make him kind of, it's, it's, I, I, I think, almost an, a, a type of independent voice. Um, uh, well, maybe not this one. This one is more Kongzi's. Uh, uh, what happens to Kung Zha, how he's affected by Yen Hui's death. Um, and if you see the, there, there, there's a movie called Confucius that was uh, kind of made for TV, made for CCTV movie um, a while ago. And there, there, there's a huge kind of moment when Yen Hui dies, he's like under the ice or something waving to Confucius and Confucius. <laughs> anyway, but, but, but actually in the Analects, for example, there's, there, there are these passages um, and, and this is the most famous one where when Yen Hui dies, the master says, alas, heaven has bereft uh, me, heaven has bereft me. Uh, this is DC last translation again. Um, and what's kind of interesting in the Analects is that there's a whole run of, of passages that begin Yen Hui died. If you've read the Analects, you know that it's a fairly, it seems a, like a somewhat randomly organized text in some ways. But there are a few kind of co runs of coherence, and one of them is these various passages about Yen Hui, which appear together. Um, they're also kind of uh, uh, together in some other texts, like uh, other Han texts uh, called like the Shuji or the Chuncho Fan Lu. And, and, and so, so here's one. So this is, takes the passage I just read, when Yen Yuan died, the master said, heaven has bereft me using um, DC Lao's translation. And then it works it into a kind of discussion of fate, uh, a discussion of kind of Confucius's uh, sadness at when his other disciples, uh, another disciple dies when Zulu died, the master said, heaven has put a curse on me. Um, when in the West, a Lin kind of often translated as unicorn for reasons I don't understand. Here, here's the Lin down here, uh, not doing very well. A Lin beast was captured. He said, my way is at its end. My way is at its end. Three years later, he grew weak and died himself. Looked at from this perspective, sages know whether the allotment they receive from Tian from the cosmos is thriving or whether it's over. An allotment is something from which one may not be rescued. Um, so, so what happens here is that we've got kind of the Yen Hui passage then at the beginning of a discussion of allotment and how the sage knows that his allotment is over. And so they put a couple of disciple deaths and then this famous thing in the Han Dynasty, the capture of this unicorn uh, this also appears in, in some of the, the texts 
ancillary to the chuncho, the spring and autumn annals, is or and in the Mengzi, he says, you know, I, the, they, these kind of signs indicate to him that he's never going to be uh, a kind of political leader. He's never going to have political success. So according to Mengzi, that's when he turns to writing the chuncho to encode his his way for future generations. Anyway, um, so this this idea of Yan Hui's. Uh, no other disciple is spoken of in this way. Um, and and uh, Yan Hui in particular is often described as a Xian. Confucius has said, says often he's a Xian. Xian is a worthy. And so if Kung Zi is a sage, a sage needs a worthy uh, um, in kind of early, early kind of histor early Chinese historiography. And so Yan Hui's death then, like the unicorn, is almost an omen or a sign to Kongzi that his, his way will not be, um, uh, uh, well, it, it isn't an end. So he has to turn to writing instead. Um, uh, so, so this is kind of the first theme that you see across a lot of early texts. Um, another one is Yan Hui is particularly good at mastering a certain program of training. Um, so there are a couple of passages in the Analects that are almost the same. It's just different people asking the question. So Duke I asks, which of your disciples is fond of learning? Kung Zhu replied, Yan Hui was fond of learning. He did not take his anger out on others, nor did he ever make the same mistake twice. Unfortunately, his allotment was brief and now he is dead. Now there is no one, nor have I heard of anyone else who is fond of learning." Right? So um, Yan Hui was unique in this, in this way he's able to pick up the program. And there are a number of passages in the Analects that single out Yan Hui as particularly good at something. <laughs> Hi guys, come on in, welcome. Um, <laughs> So another one is just a different person asking, Master Ji Kang asked, which of your disciples fond of learning? Kung Zhu replied, there was one Yan Hui who was eager to learn, but unfortunately uh, his allotted span was a short one and he died. Now there is no one, right? But actually Yan Hui's abilities in the, this type of thing don't only appear in that text. So for example, um, in the Shi Tzu, which is one of the wings of the I Ching, the Book of Changes. So this is a Han text. And uh, here we get Yan Hui being praised. Uh, it says, Master said, Yan the younger is nearing perfection. Whenever he does something that is not good, he always realizes it. Whenever he realizes it, he never repeats it. The Changes says, and specifically this is a quotation from um, the line statement for one of the hexagrams, this hexagram, um, says, returning without having gone far, there's no reason for regret. This is a sign of, 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 of most fundamental kind of good fortune. So this is similar to this, except that instead of uh, talking about studying, it's talking about mastery um, uh, of the of, well, it's talking about moral mastery, but it's using it to illustrate or using the changes to illustrate it. So there's an example of Kung Zhu studying the, 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 the changes, right? The, the theme of the musical performance um, uh, earlier today. And then in the Zhuangzi, this is also the case. Very often, Yan Hui is talking to Zhuangzi about, or talking to, to, to another person, about a particular program of self-transformation. Um, so for example, there, there's the, the famous one of Xinjai. Do you know that one? About fasting. So, so they start talking about fasting and Kong you know, says, well, there's fasting, but then there's also fasting of the mind. And, and so that's, that's a famous one. Another famous one is this one called Zuo Wang, which is sitting and forgetting. Um, and, and that, you know, in the Tang, there's, there's a famous book called Sima Cheng Zhen called the Zuo Wang Lun. And, and then uh, there are other six, you know, from six dynasties through Tang, 
uses of the text of, of this dialogue to talk about meditation practice, right? So, so this is a, a, a different program from studying. Well, I don't know how different it is. I mean, we don't really know what was meant by she in, in the, in the Lunyu, but anyway, Kongzhen jumped up and said, what are you talking about sitting and forgetting? This is just a small passage from, from, from what is a much longer kind of discussion of Yan Hui's kind of um, Kongzhen's and Yan Hui's, Yan Hui's progress along the lines of, of sitting and forgetting. Yan Hui said, at this towards the end, right? Yan Hui said, I have extra, extricated myself from my physical body, dismissed my hearing and sight, left my form and abandoned knowledge and become the same as the great road, um, right? This da tong. Um, uh, this is what I mean by saying sitting and forgetting. And so this is an example of kind of the, the, the kind of different type of content that you get in the Zhuangzi put into Yan Hui's mouth. But what's the same is that he's this disciple who is, is particularly good at whatever program it is. So, so in a way, you know, is this, I, I think, you know, when I first learned uh, uh, the Zhuangzi, my, my teacher would have said, oh, this is a, a riff on the Analects, that the Analects must have come first, and, and this is, but, but actually, I, in a little bit, when I talk about when the picture of Yan Hui as a strict confusion kind of was fixed, this is before that, it's really hard to tell. And if we look kind of at this third category, this third and last theme that Yan Hui turns up in, we see that even in Confucian sources, Yan Hui has this kind of um, uh, emphasis on all sorts of things that sound rather Taoist in some ways. So for example, um, this, this, so this third theme is unaffected by poverty, Yan Hui enjoys his abode, that is. Um, and this is, this is actually the theme that gets picked up in the Song period by Confucian writers, especially as, as, as kind of a, 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 a topic. And Yan Hui is kind of exalted during that time as someone who was able to be satisfied with a meager existence because he's a uh, poor existence because he's so devoted to a life of um, uh, self-cultivation. So in another kind of warring states uh, a text called Zhong Ni Yue, which it was bought by Anhui University. Um, so this is literally sayings of Confucius. One of those sayings of the 20 odd sayings that were found in this warring states text is begins, Zhong Ni said, just one scoop of cereal and a ladle of sauce. Others couldn't endure the, the, the anxiety um, that comes from living in these, this, this simple way. Um, but he himself could not contain his joy, okay? So there's a kind of um, a, a comparison being made. Everyone else can't stand this, but he finds, he, he, he himself is not able to contain his joy. He says, I am not, the match of Hui, right? So, um, uh, the, 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 so, so even Confucius says, I, I, he's superior to me in this particular way. Um, this is close to a passage in the Analects actually. Um, so this is, this, is, this is what we find. He says, uh, worthy indeed is Hui. This is the word worthy, right? So, so I, I, I used to describe Yan Hui. Um, a scoop of food, a ladle of drink, and a place in the alley would cause others unbearable anxiety, but Hui does not allow it to affect his enjoyment, right? And this Bu Gai Qi Lu is, is, is often in later times cited, especially in Song Neo Confucian writings, as, as a, a, a kind of the key to Yan Hui's importance among the kind of early Confucians. Um, worthy indeed is Hui. So this is this um, this passage is kind of the the perhaps the most important one about Yan Hui uh, from the early times. Um, but we see we see this motif in different in different places. Like for example, in the Chuangzi, you get something kind of similar. Um, 
Kong Zi said to Yan Hui, you know, come here, Hui. Uh, your family is poor and your position is low. Why don't you, you try to become an office holder? Why don't you see if you can, um, you know, earn some money for them, right? Why don't you go down the career path? Um, Yan Hui replies, I don't want to serve an office. Um, outside the city walls, I have 50, uh, let's say acres of farmland, enough to provide me some gruel. Inside the walls, I have 10 acres, enough to make silk thread and hemp. Playing the chin, right? We've, we've, we've done that, uh, <laughs> is enough to entertain me. And studying my master's way is enough for my enjoyment. I don't wish to take office. So he repeats that. Um, so this is kind of the, 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 the kind of a, 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 a real kind of point where we see the Yan Hui and the Analects and the Yan Hui and Zhuangzi kind of, kind of being somewhat similar, right? I mean, he seems to have a fair amount of land though, but, but, <laughs> but I, th I think we're supposed to read this as, as, as simple you know, as, as being satisfied with simpleness. He doesn't, he doesn't need uh, the job um, that Kongza is trying to push on him. A somber expression came over his face and Kongza said, that was very well put. I have heard that one who knows when they are content will never be caught up in the pursuit of profit. One who understands how they have gained something will not fear its loss. And one who engages in inward cultivation will not be ashamed of lacking official position. So this is, this is kind of, Kongs is not saying that this is his words, but he says, I've heard this. And, you know, jizu uh, is, is a phrase that you find in the Laozi and the Zhuangzi and is a very important kind of term talking about knowing when you've had enough, knowing satiety kind of, you know, so, and, and, and so it's a, a very important idea that, then, you know, in the early period is, you know, applied to politics, you know, the, the rulers who keep invading other countries and keep wanting more and more and more are the ones that eventually get um, their, their, um, their skulls made into drinking mugs. Um, and so, so this is a strategy, right? This is a strategy that can be applied to politics, but it's a strategy that's especially useful in your own life. And so Kongzi says, you know, I've heard that. Um, I've often repeated these words. I've even told other people that. But here I was kind of pushing you to get a job because then I could say, oh, look, my disciple got this job. <laughs> and, 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 and so the, 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 the you know, I, I've heard this, but only in Hui have I now seen these words manifested, right? It's I who, who gained from this. Okay. So this is... This is kind of, you know, I think a, a really wonderful kind of passage, which could be read almost as a gloss on the Analects, not as, not as something that's necessarily contradicting it. Um, there's another passage in, a, in a, a Han Confucian text that has something kind of similar. It's called the Han Shu Wai Zhuan, which is a, a Western Han text. And it's kind of often will take stories that are kind of going around in the Han, including passages from the Laozi and Zhuangzi occasionally, but also including, um, uh, uh, excuse me, take, take stories that are circulating and then gloss them with a passage from the Book of Odes, the Confucian classic, the Odes, or from the Laozi and Zhuangzi sometimes. And so here's, here's one of these passages. Yen Yuan asked Confucius or Kongzi, I would like to be able to regard my poverty as wealth this is uh, the Hightower translation from 1952. So, um, uh, to take my mean position as a noble one, to make myself esteemed without recourse to physical violence, to enjoy friendly relations with officials, and for the rest of my life to have no trouble, would this not be worthwhile? Kongza said, excellent way. Now, if you regard poverty as wealth, knowing when he has enough, he is without desire. Oh, no, excuse me. If one regards poverty as wealth, knowing when he has enough, he is without desire. If one takes a mean position to be a noble one, being yielding, he is possessed of Li. 
If one is esteemed without recourse to physical violence, being resentful, he offends against no one. If one for his whole life has no trouble, it's because he chooses his words before speaking. These are all kind of pretty good advice, right? Um, one like Hui is perfect. The saints of antiquity themselves were no better than this, right? So again, praising Yan Hui as being kind of better than himself. And also just putting together some of these same terms like Zhu and so that you can be without desires, right? Yan Hui really sounds like someone whose main kind of claim to fame in some ways is that he, he knows sufficiency and is satisfied because he doesn't have desires for anything more than he needs for subsistence. So, you know, this, this main kind of um, uh, uh, move, this kind of inward turn that we see with Yen Hui is at the boundary of two of these themes. So mastery of the program, he's the only disciple who's really able to live this, uh, 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 I don't know, mendicant lifestyle. I'm not sure what it is. And, and at the same time, be satisfied with it. And so in the Shunzi, for example, Kongzi um, asked the same question to three disciples, um, just like in book 12 of the Analects. Um, he asked Zhu Lu and Zhu Gong this question, and then he turns to Yan, Yan, Yan Hui, Yan, Yan Yuan, and asks the same question. Yan Yuan answered, and the master turns to him, and he says, Hui, what is the wise man like and what is the humane man like? Right, this is the question he's asked all three of them. And most of them have these outward focused answers saying what behaviors these two types of people do. Um, I, it's interesting, he asks the same question. That's what we have to do when we do job interviews at Berkeley. You have to have a script, right? Because you don't want to in any way have any type of kind of favoritism. So you go mechanically through 10 questions for each applicant. And I, I just am realizing that this, there's a precedent for this. And maybe <laughs> what Kongs is doing is interviewing his disciples at, for jobs in a kind of fair, fair way, um, maybe. Uh, so so Yenyuan replies, he says, the wise man knows himself and the humane man cares for himself in some way. And the master said, you deserve to be called a Ming Junzi, an enlightened gentleman in Knobloch's translation. So, so this is, he, he does this inward turn or the same kind of, you know, uh, in the Huainanzi, you, 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 get, you get a passage and the Huainanzi is also a Western Han text. So, so I'm still in that moment before the Shiji, before you begin to have this real strict bifurcation between Ru and Dao, right? So, so here we get, if you allow your mind to wander in peace and quiet and abandon the body to leisure, this is Major's translation, thereby awaiting heaven's decree, even something as grand as the world isn't sufficient to change your, your, your unitary vision, right? Um, so this, should the sun or moon be eclipsed, it will not be sufficient to compel you to change change your intentions. So you're pretty focused, right? Um, uh, thus, though lowly, it is as if you were honored. Though impoverished, it's as if you were wealthy, right? So this is the same kind of, if, if you remember what we just saw with Yan Hui, um, in, in these passages is the same reversal, right? The exact same language. Um, Yan say, I, I want to regard my poverty as wealth, take my mean position as a noble one. Um, uh, if you regard poverty as wealth, uh, knowing when you have enough, uh, if you take a mean position to be a noble one, this reversal, right? The same kind of reversal that's a mainstay of the Laos and Zhuangs of these early texts. Now, I'm not saying that Yan Hui is a Taoist who wandered into the Confucian community and became Kongzi's bestie, although I'm not saying he wasn't, but really what I'm trying to say is that before you really get a, a, a kind of sen sense that the Confucians and the Taoists are fundamentally different, before there was that kind of self-identification 
this idea of reducing desires was kind of a, a, a desideratum of both groups. They really wanted you to, to reduce desires. And among the early community around Kongzhu, around Confucius, Yan Hui was that figure who had a particular talent for it, or for whatever reason, he, he cultivated the program better than everyone else, and therefore was able to do this reversal, was able to adjust himself so that he, he treated poverty as wealth and, and treated kind of having a low position as, as being kind of noble, um, and for that reason, didn't seek an official position. Okay, so, so we've got this fluid Yanhui who goes between traditions. And at times, you know, it seems as if when he appears in the Zhuangzi or some other texts, he's kind of part of this, this idea that maybe it's kind of a lampooning the Confucian tradition. But there are other times, like in the, the idea of enjoying your abode, that actually Yanhui is fairly consistent across these traditions. So, um, so I, I want to take this as this is kind of halcyon moment when uh, 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 Yan Hui's appearance in the Zhuangzi and in, in the Nulunyu, you know, as a kind of somewhat consistent uh, a figure uh, is seen as kind of fine because really they're not different traditions, right? When does Yan Hui become kind of a disciple. When does Yan Hui become a Confucius, a disciple of Confucius? And every other appearance of Yan Hui is either a lampooning of that or, or a, a, a kind of um, trading on Yan Hui's authority. Well, I'm going to give you two moments that are both, you know, are within 40 years of each other. And these are the first two biographies of Yan Hui. And they happen at a particular historical moment. And Biographies become important, become a genre that's important because the way the disciples of Confucius are looked at becomes an important kind of teaching mechanism for the rulers of the newly unified Chinese state. So um, I, I, I'm going to show you these two biographies really quickly. and and I, I'm sure it's probably very hard to read. <laughs> but in the Shuji, the first of the standard histories, there is a, a chapter called the Arrayed Traditions or Biographies of Zhongni and his disciples, or of Zhongni's disciples, right? It doesn't have Zhongni's biography. It just says disciple biographies. And among them, Yan Hui is at the very uh, beginning. And, and it says, uh, Yan Hui was from Lu. This was his name. He was 30 years younger than Kongzi. And then it has a bunch of passages from the Analects um, that I've numbered here according to their. So what's happened is that kind of someone took these circulating Kongzi kind of traditions, like the, the Anhui University one, you know, that was just discovered, and, and have kind of put it together kind of in a in, in what they thought was a chronological order, probably Samatan or Samachen. And so, you know, you get this biography and it's made up of passages in the Analects, right? Um, there's, there are a couple passages that are more biographical. Um, so kind of the, this, this isn't a, a dialogue and this isn't a dialogue. And actually this brown part is not in the Analect, so uh, maybe there were other sources, but for the most part, it's Analects used to create the biography. And we weren't really sure about this until the discovery of a text less than a decade ago um, in, in uh, Jiangxi province. Uh, and this is a fascinating text because it's a picture. And it, so it's got the first picture of Confucius, and then facing him up here, and it's harder to see, is a picture of, of, of Yan Hui. And so, and then there's a biography of Confucius and a biography of Yan Hui. And there are four other disciples with biographies. And this is um, a, 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 a lacquer kind of screen 
Um, and on the other side was a bronze mirror. And it was in a tomb, in the center of a tomb. Um, and so this is actually first the first picture of Confucius, the earliest picture of Confucius we have. And it also gives us some really interesting information about this biography. I'm not going to. I'm not going to go into this. I have an article in Early China if you want to read this about this because it's it's really fascinating. And I I did right before COVID. I I, I went to Wuhan and then uh, <laughs> just a little bit. Uh, you know, took 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 a bus to this this town where this was, and I actually got to see this. Um, and but but the um, the 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 tomb is actually of a former emperor. Um, so this guy named Liu He uh, was a son of Han Wu Di, Emperor Wu. And in 74, he was installed as an emperor and he lasted 27 days only. Um, uh, you know, uh, Huo Guang, who was kind of the political strongman of the time, installed him, but then decided, no, bad idea, sent him to this, this, this town, uh, and, and, um, and then, you know, he died uh, a couple, a decade and a half later. Um, and, and then it was discovered in 2015 uh, near Nanchang. Um, and there are all these, these materials, but this to me is kind of the most amazing thing because it's this early example of biography and, uh, you know, mixed with, with, with art and, and you know, so there are these different disciples on the screen. And if you look at Yan Hui, here's here's Yan Hui. You can kind of see his hat uh, and his fancy, rather large shoes and his robe. And here's the word Hui, Yan Hui. And then this is this is the biography. Um, and it's similar to the Shiji one. You know, it starts out actually with the same kind of narrative that isn't a dialogue. And it actually tells you the title, where that came from. It came from a text called Confucius's Disciples. So the red, and also I think the red in the Shuji is very similar. And so now we know that the Shuji is a kind of combination of some kind of basic narrative text about the disciples that is formulaically very similar, and then a set of dialogues. Um, and actually these these dialogues appear uh, in the in the Shuji, but it's a different set of dialogues that appear in the Shuji. And actually it begins to look like the creation of dialogues about disciples was kind of an industry in this century, in the first century BCE, because here we have the same frame, you know, from this even down to this, this little non-analex passage but then different choices for each dialogue. There are different choices of passages from the Analects that are put into each disciple. So Sima Chen has one set and this has another set. So apparently taking disciple kind of passages um, uh, and, and forming biographies of disciples becomes really important during this time. Um, and, and you know, if, if we look here, we've got Kongzi and Yan Hui. Why is Yan Hui at the top? Well, he's, he's Kongzi's kind of favorite disciple in some ways. And so we get the passage about asking about benevolence uh, that was uh, I had earlier. Then we've got this passage where Yan Hui praises Confucius in a kind of um, uh, almost... Uh, a uh, hey, geographical way. Um, and then this passage that's not in the Analects about Yan Hui being pure. And then finally, the master told Yan Hui to work when employed, but hide oneself when cast aside. Only you and I can do this. That is, so he says to Yan Hui, you know, of, of our whole community, you and I are the only ones who, when there's a favorable political situation, will be employed, but when there's a bad ruler, um, uh, uh, we'll hide ourselves when cast aside, right? So, so this, and it, so I, I think of this biography, uh, 
like Kong's biography here, Yan Hui is over here, and 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 in his biography it ends with this passage where you know only you and I, and they're at the top. I guess that's kind of a. Uh, 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 perhaps why this is interesting. Anyway, um, so this is his biography. And you notice, so this is the moment when Yan Hui becomes defined as, you know, it's the Analects passages. And the reason for this, the reason that this is kind of important for the ruler is that Kongzi during this time was was used, the reason he had this mirror stand is that Kongza is an example for the ruler and his estimation of his disciples, his understanding of their strengths and weaknesses is the model for the ruler employing the, his ministers in the right way. So during this time, it's put on the, the mirror of the, of the emperor on the back of the mirror of the emperor, because the role of the, the ruler is to employ the right ministers, just like Kongzu was able to evaluate his disciples. And that's why the Analects is so full of those comparisons. You remember Zulu versus, versus Yan Hui? We were just talking, we were looking at that as a kind of, the Analects, half the Yan Hui stories are about comparing Yan Hui to other disciples because the Analects was, was formed, was chosen, selected in the same type of context. It was taught, the first commentators on the Analects were, 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 were uh, worked in the imperial court. And, and the idea that Kongzi, the, the reason that Kongzi becomes such an important figure right at this moment is because his evaluations of these disciples are supposed to be the model for how a ruler should employ his 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 uh, 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 um, the people who work for him. Okay, so this is the moment when Yan Hui becomes a much more exclusively Confucian figure because he is his biography is written at this time and it's within this court Confucian context. So now that I've, I've talked your ear off about early images of Yan Hui and the closure of, or the, the narrowing of his biography in this way, what I wanna do is skip to the point when his, it opened up again and people started reading Yan Hui as not an exclusively Confucian figure. Um, and so, um, this is, this is the third part of the talk. So changes in reading practices in the Song and Ming and the recovery of a more robust view of Yan Hui. Now, this might not be interesting in a, in a you know, the, the, these figures, uh, Li and Zhuo, Lin Shi Yi and Guang Zhen are, are three kind of fairly well-known intellectuals in their time. They're not household names. I'm not saying that you know, they're particularly profound readers, but there's something about the way they're reading these Yan Hui stories that's different. And there begins to be, sometimes people talk about the rise of syncretism in the Song and Ming periods, right? So in the Ming, you'll talk about how that there's this San Jiao Hui, that the three traditions, you know, this, this idea of, of combining the traditions um, becomes very important there. I'm going to tell you a particular kind of sub-story about that phenomenon that, that has to do with the way Yan Hui was read in these different, different times. So I'm going to start with Li Yuanzhuo, this Song figure. Um, so he, he's writing at the end of the Northern Song period. And he wrote a book uh, uh, called Ten Discussions on Zhuangzi and Lietzi. And so the, he talks, he basically has essays. They look like essays on Master Zhuang, on Zhuangzi and one on, on, on Master Lia. Um, and they're really different because they're not interlinear commentary. They're more like lectures on these different Zhuangzi stories. And the reason is that Li was a teacher in the Imperial Academy. Uh, in the, in, at the end of the Northern Song period under Emperor Huizong. And what Huizong did in 1118 is 
he created a particular academic program um, that required people to study both Taoist and Confucian texts. And Li Yanzhou was an expert in the I Ching, in the Book of Changes, right? Um, and so he taught in this school, and this is the way it was organized. So, so the, the edict that Song Hui Zong um, issued says, from now on, all those people who study the Tao are guaranteed entry into local kind of schools or studies to receive instruction. Besides the main classics of the Huangdi Neijing, this medical text, and the Tao Te Ching, and secondary classics, Zhuangzi and Liezi, all will learn the Ru books, making them into a single way with the Ru classic I Ching and the secondary classic Mengzi. So there's this idea, oh, nice seeing you guys. <laughs> bye bye. Um, there's this, this, um, this idea that the, the, the Zhuangzi and Liezi are kind of the, the minor works after Huangdi Neijing and Tao Te Ching. And so Li Yanzhou, who's um, a, 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 an expert in the I Ching, is giving you lectures on these texts. Because if you're a Confucian studies major, he's teaching you your, your Taoist minor in some sense. And so, so what it ends up doing is kind of mandating that people read across traditions. So Li's essays suddenly have a clear academic purpose since the lectures on Master Zhuang and Master Lia match with the secondary classics mandated by this imperial edict. And indeed, um, uh, these lectures probably date back to this institutional structure where he taught under this program. So if you remember this, this passage about sitting and forgetting and about uh, Yen Hui saying that he's become one with the Datong, the great road, and so he's able to sit and forget. Um, Li Yuanzhou ends his lecture on this passage called on sitting and forgetting by combining this Yen Hui dialogue about sitting for forgetting in the Zhuangzi with a reference to the I Jing description of Yen Hui's mastery and an inference that Yen Hui's forgetting is the same as Kongzi's participation in the world. And this is really hard to read, honestly, this Chinese. Um, I, I, I was kind of lucky because I did a translation of this and then hid it in a drawer because it's just really hard to, but then um, I, I, I ran into this guy named Russell Sage, who is a lecturer in Hong Kong now, who did a dissertation on this text. Um, and so uh, I feel confident now in sharing this um, because I've had the benefit of looking at his work. Um, so it's, it ends, this is the end of this essay and it's talking about be and sure, which if you know Zhuangzi, this idea of this and that in the second chapter of the Zhuangzi are important. He says, could you take this and that and use one to negate the other? No, the way has neither affirmation or negation. Could you say that one is genuine while the other is false? No, the way has neither genuineness or falsity. Yen the younger, this is the, the Yi Jing way of referring to him, turned his back on the dust of the world to return to the miraculous. Um, he simply, uh, uh, sorry, there's no not, traded substance for emptiness. I know that his forgetting is like not having yet forgotten. If you advance along the way, then not forgetting is forgetting. Kung Zhu traveled this way for 60 years and transformed himself 60 times. Why should he value forgetting? He's kind of, Yen Hui is able to sit and forget. What this teacher at the Imperial Academy is trying to say is, well, there are really two ways of doing this. Kung Zhu was able to sit and forget without forgetting. Yen Hui had to sit and forget in order to forget. <laughs> Yen Hui is in some sense then also being again, put on the same level as Kongzhu in a certain way, um, despite the fact that in the original Zhuangzi passage, he isn't. But Li Yunzhou in these various lectures does things like he cites the Mengzi, he brings in the Mengzi, and generally speaking, he uses a lot of, I wouldn't say Buddhist language per se, but kind of the, what the equivalent of, 
of, of literati references to Buddhism were at the time. And so this actually, Russell Sage says he actually is a, a, a very Buddhist in this reading. Um, so so I'm, I'm not, I, I shouldn't even say he's not Buddhist, but, but it's, it's usually somewhat more indirect. Now, a little while later, we get another figure named Lin Chi Yi. Um, and he's identified in, 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 in historical sources as a Neo-Confucian. Um, and he, he has this colloquial, colloquial explanations of the Zhuangzi. So this is the second Song Ming figure I wanna talk about. Um, and he actually is in a Neo-Confucian kind of lineage. Um, he's in the school of Li Guangchao. Um, called, it's called the, the, the Ai Shen uh, uh, tradition, sub-tradition. Um, uh, Lin Guangchao was a second generation disciple of Cheng Yi in Luoyang, and a young Zhu Xi listened to Lin Guangchao's lectures in Fujian. So really he has impeccable kind of Neo-Confucian um, uh, uh, pedigree. Um, but if you actually read this text, and this text became very important, especially in Japan and Korea. Um, so the, you know, while Guosheng's commentary uh, was the dominant one in China through the Tang, and then there's a tongue sub-commentary that, that, that becomes very dominant. Lin Shi uh, 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 if, if, you, if you go to Korea or Japan, this text actually is, is the dominant kind of lens through which the Zhuangzi is read um, in, in, in imperial or pre-modern times uh, in both countries. Um, so for example, if you remember the Great Road, Lin Chi Yi is much more willing to bring in kind of other, other traditions. So he says, the great road is talking about the great Tao. And this is what Shinza meant by, for the sage, there is nowhere he does not penetrate. So there's, he, is, he finds a, a passage in the Shinza that uses Tong and, and, and says, you know, this is, this is what the great road means in the Zhuangzi. So he's glossing Zhuangzi with Shinza. Right? But he doesn't stop there. Studying the two characters of sit and forget, um, it's just what Chan Buddhists call facing the wall, that is to sit in meditation and contemplating a gongan, right? Um, becoming identical, this is going through the passage about sitting and forgetting, is to become identical with the way. Becoming identical with the way is to have no likes and dislikes, right? So again, not having likes and dislikes, particularly useful when you're talking about yin hui, um, is to be transformed. If you're transformed, there's nowhere for you to live uh, to give birth to your mind. Therefore, it says, if you're identical with it, then you have no preferences. If you're transformed, then you have normal content, uh, constants, right? So this is, this is, you know, you have no place that you can dwell and give birth to kind of mental mental phenomena in some way, right? So it's, it's this idea kind of, it's, it's kind of a wuxin kind of idea, um, uh, which is what, um, uh, what uh, uh, we just saw before with Li Shibiao um, in, in terms of interpreting this, this practice. And so you get this, this very Buddhist, I think, Buddhist style of reading, but it's being brought in with Shunzi, right? So this is a, a type of reading practice that is very different from what had happened before. This, this, so in some sense catalyzed by Song Hui Zong, Li Shibiao's kind of bringing in other texts much broader than just kind of the tradition of Zhuangzi commentary to elucidate the Zhuangzi starts having a ripple effect. And you see it even as far as, um, as, as, as the Ming. Oh, and I have this, this, this slide too. So this is, this is um, uh, one of Zhu Xi's uh, disciples. So this is another Neo-Confucian who's talking about Yan Hui. Um, he, this is actually one of Zhu Xi's direct disciples and actually Zhu Xi's son-in-law. Um, he married Zhu Xi's uh, second daughter and he was an expert in the, the I Ching during the Song. Um, and he says, Yenzi's view in Analex 912 is definitely not something that the later tradition can really get a handle on. Um, uh, those who dare put it into words 
Um, turn to borrowing kind of fallout, kind of uh, uh, theories from Buddhism and Taoism um, in order to describe the sage. Uh, those who don't dare put it into words are cast into this land of unfathomable discussions of void and nothingness, right? So, so they're recognizing in a way that, that there is this aspect to Yenhui's speech, even in the Confucian texts, that jibes almost better with, with Lao Tzu and, 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 and Buddhist discussions, right? And so that's why in this, this tradition, um, uh, not only is, is Yen Hui's uh, being satisfied with his abode wherever he's living becomes a, a major kind of philosophical point in Sung Neo Confucianism, but you know, more and more, the Confucian commentaries on those passages in the Analects are drawing from other Yenhui stories. So we had the closure in the Han of, you know, Yenhui's ability to cross traditions. But in the Song, partly catalyzed by this idea that a curriculum, you know, you need to be well-rounded. So you need to read these texts against each other all of a sudden Yenhui is opening up again and the Yenhui and the Zhuangzi and the Yenhui and the Analects start to be read against each other. Uh, the last one I have is a late Ming text called I, I Guan Bei Zhuan. So, so, so it's an alternative history of the single thread um, that binds Confucius's teachings together. And it's this synthetic discussion of major works in the three traditions written by the Chan master Guangzhen. Um, in his essay on the Zhuangzi, Guanzhen discusses nine different sections of the, uh, of the Zhuangzi, including the fasting of the mind dialogue between Yenhui and Confucius. Not only is this the same number of essays, nine, as the Song lecture Li Yuan Zhuo, Zhuo did on the, um, on the, on the Linyu, uh, excuse me, on the Zhuangzi, um, but also, Guangzhen explicitly quotes Yuan Zhou's essays in his work. So he read these, uh, he talks about uh, Yuan Zhou's essays um, when he's talking about the butterfly dream passage. And, um, and his reading is actually very similar to Li Yuan Zhou, Zhou's. So Guangzhen ends the section on Xinjai on this note, comparing the Zhuangzi's fasting of the mind or Xinjai to the empty mind uh, of, of Song Yue Yuan Gui uh, uh, from chapter seven of the Chuan Deng Lu, uh, of the Jing De Chuan Deng Lu. And um, so he says, this can be called mind or it can be called not mind. Uh, it can be called um, fasting or it can be called not fasting. Um, only then do uh, and these are two, two passages from this uh, Song Dynasty uh, Chan work. Um, only then do confused and upside down is not intoxication and dealing with excesses, lies and doubts does not kill, um, emerge, uh, which is also uh, what about this? So, so this, is, this is a very kind of Chan reading, but he's talking about the fasting of the mind and how, um, you know, how these types of uh, um, uh, uh, rules emerge from the mind that is not, that is, that is kind of fasting in that sense. So, um, and, and effectively, you know, so, so in the Chuan Deng Lu, um, this discussion of these different rules about uh, intoxication and killing, then says, you know, you need Wu Xin to get to this, right? So Wu Xin then um, is, he's effectively comparing Xinjai, the Xinjai practice, the fasting of the mind in the Zhuangzi with the Wu Xin practice uh, of no mind in, in, in the Chuan Lu. So, so this is, and, and this is, you know, he's explicitly doing it on the model that we saw in the Song. So, so I think that the, the that's my last slide. It, it talks about how the genre of commentary creates and eliminates boundaries across traditions. And I just wanna close with a set of questions that kind of recapitulates some, or, or kind of talks more, more, more abstractly about some of the historical things that I've just talked about. Um, uh, so the first one is, 
you know, genres have different functions. Um, what does the genre of commentary do? And, you know, we all come into this thinking, well, the genre of commentary is to elucidate the text it's commenting on, right? Okay, but when you actually look at the commentary, there's also something else it's doing, and that's eliminating, creating and eliminating boundaries. When you're reading, and, and I, I've taught this course on, 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 on Zhuang's interpretation for a while, and I should have known this all along, but really one of the, the fundamental things that I've realized is that what you read, in this case, the Zhuang's against, almost determines how you read it. So there are some commentators working within the tradition who will just look at the rest of a chapter to interpret a particular passage in a chapter. Others against the whole Zhuangzi, but nothing else. Others, Lao Tzu Zhuangzi Liezi. Others, kind of Dao Jiao, kind of, kind of uh, uh, you know, in interior alchemy texts, for example, Nadan texts. Then in the Song, when you start to read it against the Mengzi, you get a very different reading. And when you start to read it against things like the I Ching or the broader kind of Confucian canon, yeah, oh, it's, it's different again. And then once you start getting these Chan masters reading it, like, like um, well, famously in the Ming, Fang Yi Zhi, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and his Chan Buddhist master who has a separate kind of chapter by chapter commentary, um, then you get another type of hybridization, right? Um, and so, so the, the genre of commentary will tell you about what, you know, what they're reading, you know, and in a way, in, in, for this type of text in the pre-modern period in China, you know, in a way what they're doing is they're, they have a certain idea of the author in mind. Was Zhuang's about this alternative to Confucianism, in which case we're, we're, we're conceiving of him as just kind of in, in conversation with other Taoist texts? Or was the author of the Zhuangzi somehow part of a, you know, either political or maybe an apolitical world that included other types of texts, in which case the I Ching, for example, can be brought in. And so this is one thing that commentary really, really talks about. And then when you read commentary over time, you begin to see how it was, you know, at times people read things very narrowly. We can only read this in the Buddhist studies room or broadly and say, well, we can go between the two reading rooms and read it, for example. So what determines when we read commentary against one text or tradition and when we open up our interpretations to bring in other texts and traditions? Now, I don't want to get rid of the idea that, that Actually, you know, there is author intentionality and people might choose this because they feel that the Zhuangzi really has to be read relative to the Mengzi, for example. Um, maybe people, you know, certainly they have, they have uh, uh, their own motives, but there's also a lot of historical factors that play into this. Is this written within an institutional setting? And what is the nature of that institution? I know there are a lot of people here who, you know, maybe, you know, went to DRBU at one point and then went to Berkeley at another point. Those two institutions approach the canon rather differently, right? So in some sense, the, 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 the kind of openness and closure of the canon will determine the type of reading you give to, to, to the particular text. And that's certainly true in the case we've seen. Right? So in Zhuangzi commentary, what's the role of institutions in determining reading practice as well? We saw that because the initial genre biography was done in a court setting where the emphasis on, you know, um, the emphasis on, on creating these disciple biographies had to do with trying to help the ruler learn how to evaluate people, you know? Um, then these passages in the Analects where you're comparing the disciples against each other and saying, this disciple is benevolent, but this one still hasn't gotten there or something like that, that we saw, you know, over half the Yenhui passages in the Analects are of that kind. 
that becomes really important, right? And so those are, the, those are the types of things that go into the initial Yenhui biography, causing the narrowing of the canon or the narrowing of this biography. So that's an institutional factor. And then at the end of the Northern Song, when Hui Zong says, okay, we've expanded the examination system so that it's not just Confucian texts, but also these Taoist texts, and people should also know the medical texts in the I Ching. Well, all of a sudden you start getting commentaries on Zhuangzi or lectures on the Zhuangzi, right? A new, actually a new form of commentary, these lectures. You get these lectures that are intended to teach students to compare across traditions. And all of a sudden you get this reading practices open up and you've gotten this, this, this idea that we can read Zhuangzi, you know, in, as a type of koan, right? Or we can read, you know, uh, uh, Zhuangzi, talking about, you know, the Chung brothers are, are you know, actually what happens, um, who is it? It's um, Lin Shi Yi, the guy who did that, that commentary that's still popular in Japan and Korea. When he, when he reads that passage in the Zhuangzi about, you know, uh, uh, Yen Yuan kind of um, rejecting office, you know, which I think is very consistent with the Alex. He says, oh, this is, this is not true. They, you know, they couldn't, they're, they're not telling the truth here. That's not really what they think. You know, if you want to know about Yan Hui and, and his being happy in his abode, you have to look at the Alex. You can't look at the strongest story. So he drew the line at a certain point. He is just like, you know, and, and he actually talks about Cheng Yi, you know, the Neo-Confucian, he says, if you want to know about this, read what Cheng Yi says about the Analects. This is, this is, so, so, you know, it's, it's o o open to a point. Um, but, but again, it's the institutional practice that encourages, or it's the, the, the institutional setting that encourages this different reading practice that then goes on to influence People like, you know, so, so once Li Yuanzhou gives his lectures on the Zhuangzi, this influences Lin Shi Yi, and then also influences Guangchen, yeah, you know, the, 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 the Ming Dynasty Chan reading. Um, and so, so that's a kind of interesting factor too, the way that, 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 that decisions about curriculum in institutions can have wide ranging uh, uh, effects, even on the reading of classics. Um, is Yan Hui an independent voice or is he simply an expression of Confucius or Zhuangzi? So this is, I mean, this is kind of the question lurking in the back of your minds, maybe like, wait, so why, what happens if we treat Yan Hui as maybe a, a philosopher independent of these texts? You know, what, what about him as the, this, this, this kind of you know, hybrid Confucian Taoist voice that talks about reversing conventional values in both contexts. What, you know, can, can we really do that? Or is he simply a, a, a kind of conceit used by, you know, used in these traditions to, to, to be a foil for Confucius? I mean, that's a, that's a legitimate question. Um, you know, we could ask, you know, why is it, you know, is it historical happenstance that certain voices are elevated to canonical ones and other ones are just seen as interlocutors with the great, with the great men of the past with the kind of quotation marks around it, right? So, so in a way, I kind of like this question because it means that, and it, it's a tip, it's an outsider question, right? I get to ask this question because I teach at Berkeley and, and uh, you know, I, I don't identify as a Confucian, so I can kind of be a little looser with this and say, "Hey, let's think of Yan Hui as a Confucian philosopher, rather." But but I think it's a reasonable question, and I think structurally it's a little similar to this other question: Is a commentary on a classic or a sutra an independent voice, or simply a gloss on that text? And I guess what I'm arguing is that in both cases. These are legitimate questions. And I think the answer is kind of, you know, somewhere in between because, because these commentaries, you know, are, are much more than simply transparent kind of lenses through which you can see the original text or help you see the original text better. Really, especially in a, in, in, in a tradition like pre-modern, you know, in these traditions in pre-modern China, 
commentary is itself such a major genre. And it's not simply, you know, I disagree about the way the classics were read. They're also expressing kind of a, a, a kind of promoting certain reading practices that reflect their particular commitments and kind of the, the historical moment that they're writing in. And so when you're reading commentary, you can also, you can read it for these kind of things to try to detect what are the institutional pushes and pulls trying to get you to read things differently. And, you know, what, you know, is this an example of the tradition closing and becoming insular? Or is it an example of people trying to kind of read across traditions? Uh, and why, why does that happen at certain times and not at others? Um, and so I, I feel there's kind of a structural similarity in some ways between these questions, even though they're asking rather different things. So I, I, I you know, in a way I wanted to talk about the Zhuangzi and, and, and there was a fair amount of Zhuangzi in it, but it's also kind of An Yanhui as a kind of hidden voice um, uh, who appears in, in multiple traditions. And at times he's allowed to kind of cross between those traditions, but other times he's not, he's not allowed to do that. So that's the sense in which I meant he doesn't have a fixed address. Um, not only does he live in an alley and it's, you know, <laughs> simply, but, but, but also vis-a-vis uh, -vis these traditions he does too. So that was, yeah, that's it. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, I know we're basically at time and some of you may have classes. Oh, great, uh, okay. And feel free to go when you need to go, but I'm here as long as anyone Yeah, has so questions. are there some que any questions after this? Um, Sarah. This was so rich. I, I don't know which question to ask first. Um, I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned this thing about um, you know, Confucius is a sage and he needed his worthy Yen Hui. Mm -hmm. And it's like every sage needs a, I don't, needs a worthy Xian. And I just wondered if you wanted to explore that a little further. Yeah, so, so um, one of the, I had a book, um, my tenure book uh, was on a, a text called the Wu Xing Pian and it's connected to Mengzi. And Mengzi, in two chapters in the Mengzi, they have this fascinating theory of history that every 500 years, there's a sage. Now, that's fascinating for several reasons. One is that it doesn't quite fit with the idea of monks that everyone can become a kind of, you know, everyone has sprouts in their, you know, in their mind. And so, and everyone can become kind of a, a morally uh, perfected person. Uh, but, the thinking appears to be that there are certain macro historical cycles and every 500 years, one of those people is plucked up and raised, you know, or in some way by Tian. Um, and, you, and you see an echo of this in the excavated text, Wu Xing Pian. Um, and in that text, it's really made clear that there are these sages every 500 years and in between there are worthies and the worthies are needed to kind of pass on the sages kind of, tradition to the, to, to the next sage in some way. So, well, it's, but they're, they're, they come together. They, I mean, they, they come as a package in a way. And so when Kongs is talking about sages and worthies and some of the later Han texts actually are fairly explicit about this. I have an article in a volume by Amy Olberding about this, but, but it's a, and the other reason this is so interesting is because of course, 500 years is also an important figure in medieval Buddhism in terms of time scales. Um, but this appears in the Mengzi. So uh, I don't know. Yeah. Well, and the two passages in Mengzi are kind of interesting because in one, he seems to be, oh, thank you very much. Um, he seems to be implying that Confucius is the next sage and, and you know, temporally. But in the other one, he seems to be implying that he, Mengzi, is the next sage. <laughs> So, uh, but anyway, but, but yeah, so that's the sages and worthies. Um. Thank you so much for such an illuminating talk. Uh, my name's Wayne. I have a comment and a question. Okay. So uh, first is um, Confucius has always been um, portrayed as a, as a sage, as a person with a per perfection. And it's always in his disciples that I find it that's more relatable. And today in your talk, you know, you mentioned that Yan Hui actually 
he learns through not perfection, but through mistakes and he quickly correct it. So that's actually from a learning theory perspective, much more approachable, relatable. So yeah. that's my comment. Uh, second is uh, through your rich discussion about you know, where Yanhui resides, my, which brings me to a question is why did Yanhui, what do you think is his deep motivation to become his disciple, become Confucius' disciple in the first place? Why, you know, they are maybe because of proximity, maybe because, you know, in your mind, why, why did Yanhui choose to follow? Well, his father was, was in the disciple group too. So it could be that, you know, his parents were, you know, you know, at Dharma Drum and, you know, so I grew up here and I know people like that. Um, but, but so, so I, I mean, I think that's part of the answer, but, but it's true that if Kongzi keeps saying Yan Hui is better than me at everything, you know, why didn't he just turn in his car, union card and say, okay, I'll follow you, right? And I actually, in, in, in the drawings, there's one story that's kind of like that, you know, but, but, um, but yeah, I, I don't know. That's a really good question. I would like to go. So, so the funny thing about these things is that you, you kind of, you say, well, if we, you know, if we look at Yan Hui's, my impulse that right there was to say, if we look at Yan Hui's biography, maybe we can find reasons. But I think what I just demonstrated is that the way these biographies were written, they were after the conversations, the dialogues. So really the, Biographies were reconstituted stories that were amalgams of these, these dialogues that were circulating. And so I'm not sure if I, my impulse to go back to a biography might actually be kind of, you know, completely backwards in the sense that the biographies seem to have kind of, you know, come together after these circulating kind of dialogues where where have been circulating for you know hundreds of years, so so yeah, I'm not sure where we would find the answer there. Just to shoot ahead to the modern. Yeah. Uh, as we were talking, I was thinking the philosopher came out of Plato, so forth. But what's what you're partially saying is that these texts were meant to be mentoring devices for the governments, for the rulers to- Yeah, at least during the Han, right? Yeah. Right, and of course you have the corresponding tension of the governor's rulers trying to get agency over these texts as well. Right. So as we look ahead into the modern, what do you see happening with this reading now, say post 1949, mm -hmm. with these texts as they're being institutionally, like the Confucian academies. But the other thing that came to mind was the Bible. And you see this reading of scripture over time reflecting the same kinds of re-readings based on contemporary, you know, interpolation and stuff. So if you could just expand a little on that, do you see the same phenomena continuing yeah. of reading these that way? And do you see it across cultures happening as well with say classical text? Yeah. And it's happening in India as well right now is, um, you know, the appropriation of the text for various authorities to argue for something. So right. that elasticity is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I guess the, the lesson I draw is that that you have to look at the particular historical circumstances of the period to understand how it's being used, but not expect it to ever be used in quite the same way as it was in some time in the past. Um, I, I do think there is a close, you know, to some extent, there's always going to be a relationship with the between the powers that be and the texts, and they will always, to some extent, affect our reading practices. Um, in in this particular case, um, I think about um, the speech that Xi Jinping gave uh, on Confucius's birthday, which I have my students read at the end of my Confucianism course, <laughs> and and there the rhetorical function of talking about Confucius is to assert a particular tradition's kind of um, independence uh, and, and argue that it's somewhat incommensurable with other traditions. And actually, I think in the Hindutva context, there's something similar about the use of the past, um, that what is being claimed is there is a particular Chinese way of looking at things that comes out of our cultural heritage that then is not, you know, not 
necessarily convent commensurable with you know human rights kind of readings and things like that and so I find and 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 this this sounds perhaps more critical than I mean it but that Confucius is trotted out in in by the state in particularly those contexts where it's it's to assert a kind of border. right border right, defining a border exactly and and so um the the um the, the way in which it's being used by the state in that context, I think is, is really kind of to position uh, 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 China vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world in a certain way. That said, you also mentioned the Confucius Academies. And I remember really being surprised um, right before COVID, I also, I went on a trip to Zhejiang and went to Shaoxing, which is Wang Yangming's kind of birthplace. And there were the, the amount of new Confucian academies and, 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 and businessmen who endow these kind of schools that are, that are teaching, you know, uh, a Yang Ming Shui kind of, kind of classes. I was just really surprised at seeing this. And they had, you know, these wooden desks and the style of the traditional kind of, kind of, kind of academies. That's definitely on some level, and I think there are some, some good uh, studies for this by people like Sebastian Bilot and Vincent Gossar, kind of looking at modern kind of contemporary Confucian academies. You know, there, there is, a, a, in some sense, they're pushing back against the kind of uh, uh, homogeneity and, and of, of, of values um, that the state is very comfortable with. And they're, they're kind of asserting a, a direct connection with this past that is definitely a, uh, on some level pushing back. I mean, not in all cases, but definitely the people I talked to were really eager to talk about kind of uh, uh, the past in, in a way that, you know, you could see it was a, a kind of act, a refuge from the type of Kind of economy and 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 politics that they have to deal with, um, you know. At other times, I'm sure you know these wealthy businessmen are endowing these because it gives them a certain kind of cachet. And so, so I mean, there are multiple motives, but but it is interesting that these different social locations will draw on the same traditions, but in you know to, to radically different ends. I think, yeah. I just find the uh, your, um, the talk extremely fascinating, especially on this idea that um, the idea of Zuo Wang is actually, the understanding or interpretation of Zuo Wang is actually expanded in a way from reading of um, the Buddhist idea of Wu uh, Nian or Wu Xing. And it, I can't help but wonder whether or not each generation would then warrant their own commentary, depending on what text they read. Mm -hmm. And um, and in our VA program, like the students read uh, the Analects and Drones and, and 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 the Tao Te Ching along with Buddhist, you know, Indian and Western text. And it's almost like as readers, we cannot help but allow these ideas to to um, in a way, interact, you know, with each other's and, and somehow find our own meaning among all of these texts. And I just wonder what your thoughts on, on how, how, how could we read uh, these texts in, you know, given who we are? Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, so I, at Berkeley, I'm, you know, across the hall, I have the Buddhist studies people. And, <laughs> and so I work, you know, I, I, I just, had a meeting a couple of days ago with someone I'm on the qualifying exam committee, and and it is interesting. I feel that it's sometimes surprising to me the ways in which you can't predict things. So here I look at your curriculum and I think this is much more Song Ming in the sense that you know when you read Zhuangzi 
you're not necessarily reading it as an anti-Buddhist approach, right? Um, in fact, talking to the students today, it was really clear people were making connections and, and, and thinking in terms of universals. And I've also heard people, you know, drawing lines, but, you know, they're, both are appropriate practices, right? But, but it seems, and then in Berkeley, you would think, okay, well, that's a universe, public university. And so there is less of an emphasis on, you know, reading in this kind of insider way where you only read it against the, the tradition. And yet we have a fairly conservative Buddhist studies group and, <laughs> and they actually kind of tend to draw lines a little bit more than you guys do, which is surprising, right? So I'm, I'm saying that, you know, it's these institutional factors, but again, you just want to be careful to look really carefully at those particular institutions and not judge books by their covers, right? In this case, but, but yeah, I think, I think that um, there, there are different ways of looking at this. I mean, I, I, was, I went to Stanford and, and one of my professors was um, a person named Lee Early who, who um, you know, uh, has done things on like Mencius compared to Aquinas. And what's interesting about comparison is that we group it all together and we say, okay, you know, it's comparing Mencius and Aquinas um, is the same as comparing Buddhism and and um, uh, 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 Taoism say, right? But but there's a fundamental error there in a way. And and I, I learned this reading Jay Z Smith because I went to Jay Z Smith for comparison, and he's always comparing traditions that have some kind of genetic relationship to each other, or even are using the same language. And and so he's talking about the changes in in the way. And I realized that. You know, if, if I wanted to compare like, like pre-modern Europe, um, early pre-modern Europe with uh, 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 China, say, it's a fundamentally different thing. You're comparing things that are somewhat hermetically sealed from each other. And so it's a different process. You know, you're no longer comparing similar languages or, or words that have changed meaning. You've got to think about, well, these are entirely different structures. And the shapes of their institutions are rather different. And so, so it's, a, it's, it's a fundamentally different thing in a way. And, and so, yeah, that I, I, think, I think when the type of comparison when you're doing say, you know, Zhuangzi and Huineng or, you know, something that has a genetic and, and you know, and, and, and the later people read the earlier people, but we're saying these are different traditions because well, San Zhao, right? But, but it's, it's a different process than, than say what Lee, Lee Yearly was doing with Mencius and Aquinas. And so there are different kinds of comparisons. And so when you're reading kind of multiple traditions against each other, it's, it's a fascinating and heady process, but, but, but yeah, it's, it's there, there, I think you have to kind of keep track of exactly what kind of claims you're making. Are you, are you claiming that they're similar because of some diffusion process that's historical? Or are you saying they're similar because they're both asking you to organize society in an equitable way? You know, and, and, and but but it's it's a really fun thing. Yeah. I mean, I can't I can't imagine doing a tradition and not having a kind of comparative. I mean, I think you have to, and in some cases, I mean, you're, you're, you don't have a choice, especially like in my case where I'm doing things written in one culture and one language and I'm discussing it in a different culture and a different language. I could pretend I'm being completely trans, you know, just telling you what that culture was, but I'm already, already putting it in a different vernacular and that's a comparative project right there, right? Thanks, Mark. Mm -hmm. This is such a rich talk and your research. I probably have to watch recording again yeah. in order to string yeah, yeah, see, see, things rich, together. Rich, rich is one of these words that several people have used, and that probably means too detailed. Too <laughs> detailed. <laughs> and I was particularly thrilled to learn Zhuang uh, Zikoyi when you introduced Zhuang Zikoyi and mentioned about Lin Xi. I was, and then when I read his comparison, uh, when I read he mentioned about the Zuo Wang and he, he, his interpretation. I was like, oh, I need to know you and read yeah. your 
uh, work more. So I quickly use my iPhone and yeah. look on the CTAC. So what's your resource besides CTAC, those online uh, resource? What physical book you you read? Oh, yeah. ah. oh, that, was my, that was my oh. rabbit oh, my out of the hat God. moment. Yeah. Is this the auto print thing? What? Are you? Is this the only copy you have? Are you it going is, to donate it to DRVU? Copy I have. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. To lend it to you. Okay. No, I will take a picture of it. Okay. Just throw to to learn. Feel like I found the dream because yeah. I have exactly same idea. Oh, uh, good. All right. Well, then this is this is perfect. This is perfect. perfect. And you. also, you mentioned about DC Lao's translation throughout the, uh, your talk. Mm -hmm. Is so we did a lot of translation in our program. What's your what's your Do you have any principle when you find a of, of translation from? You know, so so oh, of, of the analects, DC Lao is pretty good. He he reads everything in a very juicy kind of song style. Uh, it, yeah, excuse me. When he translates, he's reading the analects through juicy for the most part. There's some there are some counterexamples, but what you're getting is a song reading of it. Um, and really, you know, the the um, I think I I would love it if someone kind of translated he Yen's, you know, these earlier commentators too, because the song imposes a certain kind of view on things that, you know, I, sure, you're, it, it's interesting how the Alex was read in the song, but, but it, is, it is a particular way of doing it. So for example, in 12.1, when Yen Hui asked him about benevolence, you know, Zhu Xi's reading of Kong's answer brings in Li and Qi, you know, the, the, the Neo-Confucian dichotomy, brings in desires, you know, talks about how ritual is necessary to, to um, uh, uh, restrict desires. Terms, none of those terms are in the original passage, right? So it's a, it's a fairly different thing. And so DC Lao, excellent translation, uh, uh, totally uh, approachable, I think. But you have to know kind of that he's reading it in a certain way. Um, with the Zhuangzi, there are a number of really good translations. Uh, Burton Watson, I think, is, is, is um, and still an excellent translation and still more approachable than the A.C. Graham, Brooks Aporin school. Although Brooks Aporin's recent translation is, is very good. It's, it's very philosophical in the style of Graham. Um, there's also just came out a really interesting translation of the Zhuangzi, which is done according to Guo Xiang's commentary. So Richard John Lin, who's a, a, a scholar who lives in Vancouver now, he retired from the University of Toronto. Um, he's been working for decades on Guo Xiang's commentary, the earliest kind of major commentary on the Zhuangzi. And, and so what Columbia has just published is Guo, the Guo Xiang commentary that he's translated along with a base Zhuangzi that he's, he's not saying that's what Zhuangzi means. He's saying, this is how Zhuang, this is how Guo Xiang read the Zhuangzi. And I love that idea because really, DC Lao is basically telling you how Zhu Xi read the Analects, but he's saying it's the Analects, right? And really part of my talk here is that, you know, when you, you know, we, we, we claim we can kind of commune with the base text, but we're usually reading it through these lenses. And so what I like about Richard Lin doing Guo Xiang's commentary and publishing the Guo Xiang reading of the Zhuangzi is that it's transparent. It's being honest about it. It's like, you know, this is, this is how a, a, a reader uh, in, in, the, in the Wei Jin period would, would probably approach, would understand the Zhuangzi, which is, you know, a nice, a nice, now, now we just need people to do other periods too.